Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. Oh, thanks everyone for that great singing. That last hymn uh, reminds me of my grandmother. Uh, she loved that song, and uh, I've got to preach. So, uh, so true. We need uh, the Lord Jesus every single day. We are nothing without him. Uh, we're fools to think we can live this life on our own, that our own minds and our own thinking, our own abilities and strength and willpower is enough to make it through this life. And while we're here in a church, and so we, at least by word, would confess that oh, we need the Lord, you know, we're here, right? Um, often we don't live what we say. Often we live with our own depending upon ourselves. And this morning, I would like to just draw our hearts and our minds back to the Lord Jesus Christ and help us to remind ourselves how much we need him and the privilege that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to come to him and pray. Um, it's, uh, it's truly an amazing thing to come in prayer. Um, and, uh, we are really great, grateful for this time. Do you see what I see on the screen? Is there like a, we're good? All right. Well, I want to start with, uh, just a quick verse. Uh, we recently did, uh, a, a talk on prayer not too long ago. I, I preached on prayer actually not very long ago, looking back in my notes, but I wanted to start with the verse, uh, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Probably, I wouldn't say it's my favorite verse, but it's certainly one of those verses that I come to quite often as I think about prayer, uh, as I think about my need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, for those of us who have come to know Christ, who have received his gift of salvation, who have believed that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, that he has paid the penalty for our sin, and he has washed us clean by his blood, we have something very unique and special. For those of us who have chosen to say, I'm with you, Lord, I'm on your side, I believe in you, cleanse me of my sin, he promises to do that, and we are with him. And there's no need any longer for a mediator between us and God. Because we've trusted in Christ, we now have direct access to the throne of God. Many will say you have to go through a priest, or you have to go through the saints, or you have to go through a seven-step program to talk to God. You have to get approval from somebody in the higher-ups to talk to God. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says... Come boldly because of the blood of Christ to the throne of grace to receive help and mercy and grace and strength and wisdom and a way forward in your time of need. It's a blessed privilege. It's unique. It's not something that everybody has. The first prayer uh, that, that can be made in this special relationship is one of, of repentance, right? Of, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. Save me. And when we pray that, when we come to him boldly, we come to him humbly, confessing our sin, a doorway to heaven opens to us that never has been opened before. A, a way into the presence of God. What a privilege that is, brothers and sisters. What a privilege. And so I'm excited to talk about our topic today, the topic of prayer. I'm excited because I believe that prayer is not only the lifeblood of the Christian, but it's the lifeblood of the church. A church that doesn't pray is a church with no power. A church that doesn't pray is a church that has no direction from its head. And same for a Christian. A Christian who does not spend time in prayer does not have the power to do the will of God in their lives. But thank God we have direct access to the source of power. I'm going to read this quote here from Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray uh, is a hero of mine in prayer. He says, we must begin to believe that God 
in the mystery of prayer has entrusted us with a force that can move the heavenly world and bring its power down to earth. We believe that God is all powerful. Amen. We believe that he can do anything. We believe that he, we sang it this morning at our first service. He can move the mountains. He's mighty to save. He's the author of salvation. He's conquered the grave. We believe it. Amen. 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 You know what amen means? <laughs> Pop quiz. It means I agree. I agree. I agree with God. I agree with what's just been said. Amen. I agree. We need to be a little more amening around here. We need to agree. Uh, we need to be in unity on these things. That's the point of this series. Amen. amen. <laughs> so, do we believe in God? Do we believe that he answers prayer? Do we believe that we have free access to the Father through Christ? Do we believe that when we pray, God hears us? It's important to note that he hears us through his Son and through the Holy Spirit. In prayer, you have this beautiful access to the Trinity where we pray to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit brings our prayers up to God and in unity, God hears our prayers. And he always answered. Has he always answered yes? No, unfortunately, or fortunately, actually, because God knows best. If we really believe God knows best, and I remind myself of this all the time, then we believe that the power of God is moving even in the nose to work out his will and his glory in our lives. But something we must remind ourselves, we have to believe, is that prayer matters that prayer works that we have access to the heavenly world to the god of heaven who controls the principalities and the powers and the nation and holds everything by the word of his power is willing and welcoming to listen to us and to hear our prayers let that sink in for a minute yes we believe that the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from sin and we believe we have free access to the Father through Christ. That is power. We don't need to live sulking around like we have no hope. We don't need to live defeated Christian lives. We don't need to live always looking at our sin. We need to live in this power that we have access to through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, through the Father. We live defeated lives often because we don't tap in to this heavenly power. Before we get into a little more teaching, I want to tell you two stories. Two stories about prayer. One is a, a personal prayer that somebody made, and one is a corporate prayer that someone made. Because I think both kinds of prayer are things we need to focus on. Each of us individually, personally, need to have seasons and times and places of prayer between us and God that we can communicate and intimately talk with God. But equally as important is corporate prayer in the church, praying together as a body of believers, praying with other Christians, because when God's people pray, things you can't explain, they start to happen because God moves as his people pray. So the first story I want to tell you is the story of Catherine Townsend. She's unknown. I couldn't even find a picture of her online, but I found pictures of lots of her descendants. Let me tell you a story. It's a story that uh, this lady, Sister Abigail Luff, wrote. Uh, you know, Sister Abigail Luff was uh, an evangelist and a missionary to Buffalo, New York. She Amen. personally, yeah, where go? Go mind if been saved from someone who she led to the Lord. Who knows? Um, Abigail Luff uh, grew up with her parents, her mother and father, her mother was Catherine Townsend, and they were co-workers with George Mueller in England. And so she saw firsthand the miracles of things that can happen when people pray. It says that she learned to pray on the lap of George Mueller, literally, but she literally sat on his lap while he prayed sometimes. And he taught her how to pray. And her mother said, uh, some, she had to correct her daughter, Abigail, and said, you know, you don't pray as you answer George Mueller's prayers, answer my prayers. She said, pray, Lord, if it be your will. 
she had to tell her that because she saw how God answered the prayers of faith of that man. Anyway, I digress. The point of this story is on Abigail, on, on Catherine Townsend's deathbed, as Abigail was caring for her, she prayed this prayer. Lord, may every one of my children be brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and confess him publicly. May every one of their children and grandchildren do likewise as soon as they come to years of understanding. Also, may it please thee, Father, to call some for the proclaiming of the gospel in other lands. And 50 years later, Abigail noted in her book that to her knowledge, all of Catherine's children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, as of then, had then come to know Christ. And then three of her great-grandchildren were missionaries in Africa. You might recognize some of their names. Mrs. Lillian Gammon, Mr. Raymond Dibble, and Miss Kate Townsend. And I'd like to also note that since Abigail has gone to be with the Lord, at least three of her great-great-grandchildren and another of her great, 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 great grandchildren are also missionaries in Africa. Those generations are shown here. Raymond Dibble in the black and white photo speaking to a chief. His son, Spencer Dibble, his brother Arthur was also a missionary. His daughter, uh, Lois Wheeler in the, the patterned dress, and her son, Benjamin Wheeler. All missionaries, all products of a prayer prayed in the 1860s by a lady who we don't even have a picture of named Catherine Townsend. As your faith is, so shall it be unto you. Matthew 9, 22. Tell a more recent story of a church. You might have heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Kind of famous, a little bit. In the 1970s, Jim and Carol Simbala were asked to take on a small struggling church on the verge of closing in Brooklyn, New York. It's called the Brooklyn Tabernacle. The church had a handful of members and met in a rundown building. The early days of their ministry were filled with discouragement and challenges of every kind, and Jim Simbala found himself on the verge of giving up, and he desperately cried out to God for a breakthrough. As he prayed, God clearly revealed that the church was to be built on a foundation of prayer, and that this would be the source of their blessing and breakthrough that was needed. The following Tuesday night, about a dozen members, 12, joined in with their pastor and his wife to pray. They joined hands in a circle and prayed, and as a result, a new emphasis on prayer was established in the church, and the midweek prayer meeting became recognized as the most important meeting of the week. God was faithful to bless the small congregation as they witnessed him answer prayer, move powerfully in their meetings, and add to their con congregation with testimonies of miraculous life transformation. Today, the Brooklyn Tabernacle is still in the heart of downtown Brooklyn and has about 10,000 people who attend services each week. God has given them that worldwide platform through the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, and they continue to emphasize the importance of prayer as the engine that drives the church, as thousands join together each week for prayer for the needs around the world. And Jim Simbala continues to call the prayer meeting the barometer of the church. Now, we can say what we want about the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Obviously, they have a slightly different way of doing church than we do. We probably never would have a 10,000 <laughs> congregation church. We'd probably break it up into, you know, 2,000 churches, right? Uh, but the idea that prayer turned the ship of that church, I think, is very powerful. They were on death's door knocking, begging to go to the grave. And they turned and they turned to God in prayer. And it's God that turns these things around. Only God can save people. We can't save them. And they turned to God for a, a revival of people being saved in Brooklyn. And he answered. He answered. People are saved. People were brought to the saving knowledge of Christ. And so I do believe 
that prayer and the answering prayer of God exists today. I believe it can happen at Fifth Avenue Chapel. And it's the desire of our church that prayer would be a cornerstone in our assembly, a foundation in principle. Indeed, it is the barometer of the church. The quality of our prayer meeting is only as good as the spiritual quality of the people attending, right? A prayer meeting is a terrible place if our eyes are not fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Too often a prayer meeting can devolve into the airing of grievances, a laundry list of wants or complaints about poor health. And we forget that God has called us to the deeper pursuit of him through prayer. Now I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for people's health. I'm not saying that we should not pray for the things that are on our hearts that we want or for the problems in this world. But I am saying that that focus need not be on our problems, but it needs to be on the Lord. That the focus of prayer is a looking to God and saying, I need you, God, every hour. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me, oh, my Savior, I come. I don't come to me, I come to thee. I come to you. Confessing I can't do it. But declaring that you can and you can work and I can trust you Lord. I can trust you and so we're going to do a brief teaching on prayer different types of prayer that we can go to God with and I hope we can encourage each other to be more engaged in prayer as a church and to remind us that prayer is a powerful tool that we have to enter into God's presence and see him do amazing things in our time and in our world. So, scripture verse that we're going to focus on for the remainder of our time together. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in our godliness and life. So in this verse, we see four different kinds of prayer. I think all of prayer can probably be fit into one of these four categories, especially since one is called prayer. <laughs> and we can glean together how we can more effectively pray as a congregation together. So four kinds of prayer, supplications, those general prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. So we'll start with supplications. The definition of supplications is to pray humbly, to make humble and earnest entreaty or petition. A great verse that reminds me of this is Matthew 21, 22. The Lord Jesus says, whatever things you ask in prayer, ask believing and you will receive. Ask believing. And, uh, you know, we think about this kind of prayer. This is us asking God for the things that we need in our life. This is us coming before God declaring we need him. It starts with prayers of confession and repentance. We start there, uh, and we, we supplicate them. We say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me of my sin. We read about a great prayer of supplication and confession in the book of Daniel, when Daniel prays for the people of Israel, we, we, for himself. He starts with a confession of his own sin, and then he moves on to confession of the nation's sin. But it starts with a supplication, this humble coming before God. We think of Hannah, who came before God. She so desired a child. She so longed to have a son, and she came to God. You know, you might say, you know, Hannah prayed for the nations to be saved, but the Lord had put in her heart she wanted a, a child, and she came in humble, uh, in a very humble position to the point where uh, Eli thought she was drunk because she was so humble before God. And she came and she asked a request from God. She supplicated. She made an earnest entreaty or petition. She asked God for a big thing. She made her request known. The Lord heard her prayer. The Lord answered her prayer. I love this quote from Martin Luther. He says, straightway despair of your reasoning and understanding. So often, 
we are trying to figure out why things aren't going right, right? We're, we are our own reasoning, our own understanding. We're, 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 we're thinking through, we're laboring. What can we do? What can we do? And he says, straight away despair or stop your own reasoning and understanding. And instead, kneel down and pray to God with real humility and earnestness that he through his dear son may give you his Holy Spirit who will enlighten you, lead you, and give you understanding. We have that promise of the Holy Spirit that he dwells within us. But often we don't fill ourselves with that power. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. And the goal of a supplication is for us to humbly come before God and ask him. Ask him humbly, saying, Lord, your will be done these are my desires. The Lord knows our desires before we ask them. We're not hiding anything from God. We're not surprising God with our requests. He says, bring them to me. Ask. And you'll receive an answer. Ask. Too often we ask ourselves, or we ask our spouse, or we ask someone who we feel is of great value to us or has great wisdom. And certainly God uses the wisdom of other people. He uses our own understanding. But we should never think that that's enough. We should never think that we should lean on our own understanding. That famous verse in Proverbs, in all your ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. Do not lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in everything. Something that, that always stuck with me as a child was my father. He'd be working on the car and, you know, the lug nut wasn't going on or something was wrong. He would stop and pray about a lug nut. And I, I, when I, I thought it was a little silly, but, but you know what? That laid a foundation in my heart. There's nothing too small for God. There's also nothing too big for God. You want to pray for 100 people to come to this church? Start praying. You want to start praying for 1,000 souls to be saved in the short community? There's nothing wrong with praying a big prayer like that. Put it before the Lord and allow him to work. Put it before him. Allow him to do the work and to show you how you can partner with him in that work. So whether it's lug, lug nuts or souls, take it to the Lord and pray supplicate about these things. He loves to hear from his people. We need to move on. Prayers, general prayers. The word, the definition here is um, it is a spiritual communion with God. I love that word. We have communion every Sunday morning, right? We, we take the bread and the wine and we remember the Lord and we have communion as saints together with him. Well, that communion is not only for when we eat bread and drink from the cup. This spiritual communion is something that lasts day in and day out. Daily, spontaneous conversations with God. Those general prayers that we pray before our meals, those prayers that we pray before we speak, uh, as we pray for guidance and leading, as we pray prayers that we've seen written down and make them our own. I'm not one to, to, uh, to encourage vain repetition, but there's a lot that we can learn from the Lord's Prayer. But too often we just say it, you know, we just say it because, you know, it's a prayer that we memorize as kids, our Father who art in heaven. Vain, repetitious prayers mean nothing. But when we internalize those words, they mean a great deal. When we meditate upon the words, your kingdom come, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a powerful prayer to pray. But we got to know what we're praying about. These general prayers shouldn't be flippant, but they should be part of our daily walk with God. I think of that old hymn, just a closer walk with thee, precious Savior is my plea. It's that idea of walking with the Lord Jesus alone and also walking with the Lord Jesus corporately as a body of believers. George Mueller said, only a life of prayer and meditation will render a vessel ready for the master's use. Wondering why God's not using you? Wondering why we're not having victory in our spiritual lives? Take it to the Lord in prayer. God can do miracles. He can heal great diseases. He can overcome great personality faults. Take it 
to the Lord in prayer. See him work. Intercessions. Now, this is the interposing or pleading on behalf of another person. James 5.16 says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So we're lifting up other people in prayer, both believers and unbelievers, both our brothers and sisters in Christ and our chapel family here and those all around the world interceding on behalf of others, earnestly praying for them. Have you ever, maybe in the silence of the night, been woken up with a burden on your heart, maybe a pressing upon your soul, and somebody comes to mind and you have to pray for them? I remember I was in college. I was at home and staying at my parents' house, and I woke up at night, and there was a person, a girl at our assembly that was just on my heart. And I knew I just had to get on my knees and pray for her. She had struggled with eating disorder and all kinds of things. I had no idea why God put her on my mind. But I was there, and I labored in prayer for her. There's a story that Nate Burns, the missionary, tells when he was serving in Niger, of how they were driving in a car, and they were attacked by rebel soldiers, Al-Qaeda soldiers, him and his team, uh, Johnny Hayes, Justin Devane, and another person. And they were being attacked. And, and the Lord miraculously rescued them from this burning fire kind of a situation that happened in the Middle East, right? And uh, then after they got free and they were home and they were back in their safe space, started getting messages. Nate, I don't know why, but last night God had me praying for you at this time. God had me get up and pray at this time. And we had people from the East Coast, from the Midwest, from the West, from other parts of maybe France and other places praying for Nate and Johnny and Justin and the team. It's like 2, 3 a.m. our time. God moves and saves and does great things when people pray. Don't neglect to pray for other people. If someone comes to your mind, pray for them. Stop and pray. You don't know what they're going through. You might never know what they're going through. None of us are immune from struggles and problems. Each of us is facing spiritual warfare on a daily basis. If you are trying to live for the Lord, you will face opposition. It's a Bible verse. We all need prayer. And so let God, the Holy Spirit, use each of us in each other's lives. As the Lord brings someone to your mind, stop and pray for them. Who knows what they're going through? And corporately, as we're together in our prayer meetings, if the Lord brings something to your mind, stop and pray for them. We don't have any idea what's going on around the world half the time. Most of the time, actually. But God knows it all. And he uses his people as they're being led by his Holy Spirit to pray. And to, to move men and angels and principalities and powers. And to see things happen for his glory. Each time before you intercede, be quiet, Andrew Murray says. And worship God in his glory. Think of what he can do and how he delights to hear the prayers of his redeemed people. Think of your place and your privilege in Christ and expect great things. Often we don't really expect God to answer our prayers, if we're being honest. Well, God saved that person, but I don't really know if he will. But, you know, they're so far gone. But, you know, what if we say, no, pray earnestly. Intercede on behalf of the lost. Intercede on behalf of your brothers and sisters in Christ, your family, your church, and expect God to do great things. He will. He promises. And the final one is thanksgiving, a grateful acknowledgement of benefits or favors, especially to God. Great Bible verse. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. We, are, we should be such a thankful people. Being thankful that God cares for us. He protects us. He moves in us. He works us. He even allows suffering in our lives because he knows what's best. We can thank him in all circumstances. A.W. Tozer says, the goodness of God is infinitely more wonderful than we ever will be able to comprehend. And I'd like to add, or ever express. 
as we come into God's presence, as we learn to walk in prayer and to understand intimacy with the Holy Spirit through prayer, we will begin to experience and understand the deepness of the goodness of God that we cannot explain. The Apostle Paul tries over and over again to explain this in the epistles, and he never quite gets there. And eventually he just says, there's things you can't explain. And it's true. No matter how much we express God's goodness, it will never fully express how good he is. But we should try. We should try because he is so good. He is worthy of our praise and our worship, our thanksgiving. We need to work together and be grateful for all God has done, to declare his goodness in the sanctuary, in the presence of, of the Lord's people, and also privately in our homes and in our prayer closets, to be overflowing with gratitude, to begin and end our prayers with thanksgiving to God, thanking him for what he has done and also what he's going to do in the future. Our answer is prayer. Our God is good. Do we believe our God is good? Amen. So here at Fifth Avenue Chapel, how do we prioritize prayer in our meetings? Well, I gave seven examples of how we pray, and we're going to talk about how we can do better. So we start with our weekly prayer meeting on Thursday nights. If you don't come, we invite you to come. Thursday night, I know it's the middle of the week, but man, I'm so grateful for that time of prayer in the middle of the week with my brothers and sisters because... I'm tired in the middle of the week, and I'm spiritually tired in the middle of the week. It's so encouraging to see consistent and good attendance at that meeting, even when we're on Zoom. And I mean, sometimes on Zoom, we get even more than usual because we all can just log in from wherever we are. And I encourage you, come to this meeting, get the link. Uh, this is the meeting where we compile all our prayer requests in one place, and we dedicate a half hour to pray together corporately before the Lord. It is important to corporately pray. So there's private times of prayer, there's informal times of prayer, there are times of prayer where it's just the men or just the women, there's times of prayer where it's just a family, it's just yourself. But this is a corporate gathering, a meeting of the church, where we officially bring before God our petitions, our requests, and our prayer. It matters because we're all saying amen together. So I encourage you to come, Fury. Come to the prayer meeting. And then once a quarter, we spend the whole hour and 15 minutes in prayer together because prayer matters. And we have so much to pray for. It doesn't always fit in a half an hour. We find value in this corporate pattern of prayer. And 1 Timothy 2.8 tells us that the men are to lift up holy hands in prayer without doubting. But we also love to split and do men's and women's prayer times to kind of double our prayer efforts. We hope to do more of that in the future, more gatherings of everyone praying men and women and gathering together in prayer and doubling those prayer efforts of audible prayer together. We've also started doing that in our small groups, right? We've started to have these times of small group prayer time on Sunday nights where we can share more personal, intimate prayer requests, maybe something that you wouldn't feel comfortable saying in front of, you know, all these people. You might feel comfortable in front of six or seven people and you can pray together. And it's an opportunity to build relationships and fellowship through prayer. Do you have a small group you're praying with? Join one. Pray together with people in a small group. We want you to know as elders that we get together twice a month. And we're praying for you all the time, not just twice a month. Uh, we do pray for you all the time. We pray for each and every one of you. But we gather together twice a month to together pray for each and every one of you to pray for the needs of our assembly. If you have some unspoken need or some spiritual need or something you don't feel comfortable expressing publicly, come tell us. It stays in our meeting and we pray for you. We pray for the spiritual needs of the assembly. We love that there's also the bi-monthly uh, ladies missionary class and I don't go to it, but I'm told by Daniela and others that we pray at that meeting. And I'm grateful for the prayer of women I'm grateful for your prayers, ladies. I'm grateful that you take the time and pray for one another because it's a different kind of prayer than what happens on Thursday night, and that's a good thing. It's a great thing that you pray together. Monthly, the men and boys meet together for the prayer breakfast, and it's a great opportunity to raise up the next generation of men to pray. 
It's a great opportunity for us as men to pray together like the women do in the ladies' missionary class. And I look forward to how God's going to use that time even further as we grow in our prayer. We, have, we always announce the monthly missionary prayer meeting. It's a time when all the assemblies in New Jersey and in other parts of the world gather together and pray for the mission field. You're invited to come. I'm on the committee. Joey Caddy's on the committee. Get the Zoom links from us and join us as we pray for the nations the first Monday of every month. It's an awesome opportunity to pray beyond our borders. And then this last one is the North American Week of Prayer. I'll be honest, I guess it's been a number, maybe 2014, when Scott DeGroff approached me to help him with that. I said, I don't know how I'm going to pray all day. I have no idea how this is going to work. How are we going to gather people for hours to pray? The Lord brings people because we are desperate for him. We need him. And so I encourage you to join in as you're able. We know work is important to you, and so you have to work. But join in and pray as we pray for our continent, as we pray for our communities, as we pray for our assemblies, pray for our state. In this North American Week of Prayer, in the morning, CMML will host. Uh, in the evenings, we will host gathering at the chapel. We want to pray. We want to set aside this time and pray together for the needs in this country. The needs are great. The needs in our meeting are great. The needs in our communities are great. And it's one week a year that's set aside, consecrated for prayer. Join us, would you? Join us in prayer. So how can we pray more and more? How can we increase in prayer more and more? I would encourage you uh, to find more opportunities for informal prayer gatherings with the chapel family. Maybe you live in a community with other Christians. Gather together and pray for the neighborhood, for your children. Maybe you live um, kind of far away from everybody else. Well, well, try to find specific times to gather with other people to pray. Seek out informal opportunities to pray with one another. I remember uh, when Chris was single and in college, he and another young man would gather together and pray every now and again for the needs of the world. That's great. Gather with people and pray. Gather, find someone, and get more informal prayer going on. How about a neighborhood prayer walk? I was reading about this the other day. Some of our missionaries do this. They walk around a neighborhood where they're trying to do an outreach, and they pray for each and every home and people within the homes. Maybe that's a good idea to do here in Belmar. This is such a hard neighborhood to connect with, right? Maybe we need to walk house by house, street by street, row by row, praying for the people that live in those homes. Maybe we should do that in our own neighborhoods, in our own apartment complexes, praying for the houses and the people within them, praying for an opportunity to reach out with the love of Christ and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's opportunities for ministry-based prayer gatherings. I know some people gather in early in the morning, some don't, uh, once a month, and pray for the Jersey Shore Rescue Mission. There's others that pray for solutions to pregnancy. There's uh, prayer for missions around the world going on. There's specific prayer gatherings for camps that are going on. This summer, we should be gathering to pray for camp ministry. The Lord would bless it and protect it. And then this idea of prayer calls. You know, if the Lord puts someone on your heart, call them. Pray for them. You don't need a set schedule. You don't need any kind of formality there. And if they don't pick up, pray for them on the phone. I remember... I got a phone call and I and I saw the voicemail. It was like a three and a half minute voicemail. I was like, oh my goodness, is this one of those robo calls that just never ended? It was someone that called to pray for me. That meant a lot. It meant a lot. Because there was something going on in their life at that time that nobody knew about. So they called to pray for me. We can increase more and more. And these are my prayers for us as a chapel as we pray together. May each of us become impressed by and take advantage of the high calling to enter God's presence in prayer, the privilege of prayer. May each of us be impressed by this privilege and take advantage of this privilege. May the Lord increase our faith through prayer. May our faith be strengthened and fueled as we pray. May we be led closer in our walks with God and with each other. As we pray together, may we walk arm in arm in step with the Holy Spirit, praying together. May our prayer gatherings become times of corporate intimacy and dependence on God and not ritual. 
may they become deep and, and unifying times of prayer of God. May we see the power of God on display as we see those prayers answered. May our assembly be known as a place of prayer. And may our prayer life inspire our children and future generations and other churches and our local community and inspire them not just to be in awe of what God can do, but to seek the Lord themselves. That's my prayer for us. This is what I pray for our assembly when I think about prayer. Would you join me in praying for that? Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have access to your presence. Lord, we desire deeply uh, that we would be people of prayer. Lord, we ask that we would become impressed by and take advantage of your high calling to be in your presence in prayer. May you increase our faith. May you lead us closer to you and closer to each other. May we be known, may our gatherings be times of intimate and dependent prayer to you. May they not be ritual or formality. May we see you on display as you answer the prayers. May we be known as a place of prayer. And may people see you working through our prayers. And may they be inspired to seek your face as well. May we pass this on to our next generation, the generation after, and the generation after, that all may see your glory and your power. We know that revival begins and continues through prayer. And we know that the true church lives and moves and has its being in prayer. It is our lifeblood. Lord, help us to ever be dependent upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.